I think we've all heard these analogies, like the greatness in all of us is forged from the hottest fires. The greatest steel is forged from the hottest fires. And crisis does bring out a lot in people. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Thrive State Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Tian Vu, popularly known as Dr. V, triple board certified MD and performance and longevity expert. If you're new to this podcast, welcome, welcome, welcome. Again, this podcast really gives you access to the people, the ideas, and the tools to take your life, your business, your health, your performance to the next level. And on this particular podcast, that's no different. You know, in my whole personal development journey, I really got a chance to attend some really awesome events and meet some pretty spectacular people. And I met this person actually at an event called A-Fest. Now, if you don't know, A-Fest is actually an event put on by Mind Valley. And A-Fest, many people attribute that event to be like a combination of Burning Man and TED Talks. They bring in all these awesome speakers and minds from all around the world. And they would actually have these events where people are getting a lot of education, but they're also socializing in some pretty crazy costume parties. If you've been through my Instagram, you've probably seen some of those pictures. And that's where I met my next guest. And that's one thing I want to say about personal development is as you invest in yourself, as you go to these events, and particularly as the world opens up again, you get to attend in person. That's one of the most valuable things you can get from going to these events. You not only learn the content, but you start to form friendships with thought leaders. You start to form friendships with other people that want to become a better version of themselves. My next guest is Keith Ferrazzi. He's a multiple time Number one, New York Times bestselling author. He wrote, Never Eat Alone, Who's Got Your Back, Leading Without Authority. And he's here to promote his new book, Competing in the New World of Work. And let me just tell you something about Keith. He is probably one of the most wholesome uh, and most generous people I know. You know, in his book, Never Eat Alone, he talks about these slow, long dinners where he actually hosts dinner parties for people to network. But instead of just talking shop and business, it's really about opening your heart and opening yourself up, being vulnerable so you could connect with others. And it's this type of vulnerability and communication that he teaches throughout all his books. You might be wondering why I would be bringing somebody who coaches Fortune 50 companies, like the best companies from around the world to talk about health and wellness. Well, here's the thing. If you read my book, Thrive State, and if you haven't already, please pick up a copy at thrivestatebook.com, you'll know that I talk about relationships and community being one of the bioenergetic elements that is crucial for optimal health. This is really the crux of Keith's work. How do we build nurturing, supportive relationships so that we can, I'm going to coin his phrase, co-elevate together, where two people or multiple people can come together and reach a higher point by co-elevating and collaborating. I love that. And we also talk about purpose in my book being a bioenergetic element. It is when we share our own gifts with other people that is purpose. And that's what we talk about on this podcast as well. So yes, he does coach, you know, Fortune 50 companies to reach the next level, but all these techniques can also be used in your families, in your personal relationships, in schools to elevate those communities to the next level as well. So I'm super excited, you know, with this conversation. You're going to love it. So a little bit more about Keith Ferrazzi. He's actually the chairman of Ferrazzi Greenlight and the Greenlight Research Institute, where he works to identify behaviors that block global organizations from reaching their goals and transform them by coaching new behaviors that increase growth and shareholder value. Formerly, he was the CMO of Deloitte and Starwood Hotels. He's well known for spreading his ideas with enduring influence as the number one New York Times bestselling author of Who's Got Your Back and Never Eat Alone. He's also a frequent contributor to the Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Fortune, and many other leading publications. 
He has distilled over 20 years of experience from the C-suite to founding his own companies into practices and solutions he brings to every engagement. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a very, very dear friend of mine, Keith Ferrazzi. There he is, Keith Ferrazzi. What did you have on your face a second ago? <laughs> oh, this is, well, you know, you know, I am engaged to celebrity makeup person. So this is a skin hydrator. Oh, God. It hydrates basically, you know, I have to look pretty for you, Keith. You know, I've given up. <laughs> well, my age, the- I've given up. <laughs> you look great. You look great. I mean, if, ladies and gentlemen, if you've seen Keith Ferrazzi with his shirt off, you know that he is in Thrive State as well. Uh, welcome. I know you've got an event to, to appear at 11 o'clock, so thank you for your time. We start off you know, our conversations with something called Five to Thrive, which is basically five quick questions just to get the conversation lubricated for us to go a little bit deeper. So actually, it's, it's a game. Each question is worth 1,000 points, and if you win, you get a slow, long dinner with me. Remember, every question is less than a minute long, so not long answers. Question number one is, what is your favorite childhood memory? My favorite childhood memory is probably fishing with my mother. Oh, fishing with your mother. All right. Question number two. What would you say is a gift that we've received, or at least you received, through the pandemic? I fell in love. Oh, beautiful. Thank God for swipe right. (laughs) Very good. Kale, I hope you're watching. Question number three is a two-parter. One, what is a long, slow dinner. And the second part to that question is who is alive right now that you haven't actually had a dinner yet or met yet that you would like to have a long, slow dinner with? First of all, long, slow dinner is something that was a piece of beautiful advice that one of my greatest mentors, Greg Seal, who was the former CEO of Deloitte, uh, gave to me. Anytime there's something poignant and important to do with somebody, a launch of a new project, Anytime you're twisted or have a challenge with somebody, you know, business partner that you may be misaligned with or angry about, anytime that there is an opportunity to innovate or create, he said, Keith, have a long, slow dinner with that person. And it's so beautiful. And of course, the dinner versus a meeting, right? And even dinner versus a lunch, there is something about, and I know you may not approve, there's something about the social lubricant of red wine that is advantageous to conversation. And so, yeah, a long, slow dinner is just the recognition that this person is that important. You need to go and meld minds, understand Mm. each other. And in terms of who, I don't know why I thought about this, but perhaps the new CEO at Disney. Why? You know, I, I coach executive teams and coach the turnaround at General Motors and a number of organizations. I coach unicorns and I coach Fortune 50 companies. In my backyard, it happens to be one of the most important companies in the world. And it would be great to get to to know her. All right. Well, we are throwing it out in the ether to have a slow, slow dinner with you. Question number four, which is, you know, very Keith Ferrazzi style dinner. People ask this question is what might be something you're challenge with right now or potentially even struggling with right now that you wouldn't mind sharing? Well, first of all, I'm blessed. Life has been so abundant in in general with all of the disruption. I made a real commitment to utilize the time of the pandemic for a reboot. And I think what I'm probably struggling with is I'm starting now to see where I want to go in life and in and professionally. My organization, we are doing beautifully, never been better. Bottom line is I need a business partner that I can really co-create the next generation of the company with. And that is something I'm just putting out to the ether. That individual will be beautifully intimidating to me intellectually, will have an open heart. You know, interestingly, I thought I had found perhaps that person during the pandemic and was an old friend of mine who also had gone to Yale, but not with me, younger than I am. And we started working together and really loved it. But I found that our business, he was more of a products guy, really wanted to go do that. So now he's he's thriving in a products business. And, you know, I still feel like I, I tasted what it was like to get close. Mm. And so I'm looking for that business partner. All right. Well, we're throwing that out in the ether too. Last question on the five to thrive is, and it goes along with this probably, is... 
how would you like to be remembered or what would you like to be remembered for? You know, I thought about this the other day. I was looking up a friend of mine, hoping that he's still alive. This is an individual that was in his 80s and I hadn't been in touch with him for a few years. And just and I unfortunately saw his obituary. What I asked myself, I thought, you know what? I'm going to go write my obituary and I'm going to write it every year. I'm going to edit it every year. And I didn't do it yet. I think at the end of the day, I'd like to be remembered for having made a global impact on how we relate in the workplace first, but ultimately as humans and this principle of co-elevation, which is the core of my work. How do you work with a group of individuals to commitment to a mission, but to lift Mm. each other up in the meantime, that should be the mission of work and our relationships in the workplace and in life. And as you know, I was lucky enough to find my real co-elevating partner during the pandemic. Yeah. Beautiful. And this really leads us into really introducing you. Everybody here I've already introduced you knows that you're a multi New York Times bestselling author of Never Eat Alone, Who's Got Your Back, Leading Without Authority. You've got a new book coming out called Competing in the New World of Work. Now, everybody might be asking, why are we bringing somebody in that, that, that coaches these executive teams, these Fortune 50 companies? But what I have found through your- And the answer is, you're a really good friend and you're helping me promote my book. <laughs> that- But I've actually extracted many, many different things from your book that is applicable to health, wellness, and performance. You know, let's do that. Let's let's have fun during this session. Mm -hmm. And because I believe the way that when I wrote this book, it wasn't just for corporate elites. Right. Its intention was to recognize that we're in a new world today. We're in a volatile world that requires all of us to constantly look around corners and see what's possible. And the the two chapters in the book around foresight and agility, right? How are we constantly gaining insights and reinventing ourselves and what we're doing as individuals and looking around corners and then agilely adopting them, right? Mm -hmm. Collaboration and inclusion. How are we building a team around ourselves that won't let us fail, that will lift us up and elevate us. Um, That's why and of course, bring you up. Yeah. And then, yeah. of course, we have an entire chapter funded by, the research was funded by Weight Watchers and uh, Headspace, all about resilience, right. which is, you know, to me, the big lesson of the book was that life and work is no longer an individual exercise. Resilience and well-being particularly mental well-being is no longer an individual exercise. I think at the end of the day, it's a team sport, but yet we're playing it as an individual sport. And we need to be able to have that co-elevating team around us in our lives and that commitment to elevating each other's energy, elevating each other's careers, elevating each other's success, elevating each other's mental well-being. That's just so critically important. Yeah. And you were someone that definitely walked the talk. I mean, you have taken me in to be a friend, a mentor to me. And so thank you for teaching me all of that. And for those of you who haven't picked up a copy of my book, Thrive Day, Keith is also on the cover. You can see his quote right up there. But I basically talk about these elements of relationship and community and also purpose as actually energies that feed ourselves to give us access to optimal health, longevity, and peak performance. And, and that's what your work is really about. It's about the Lifting up, you know, other people up. It's really about these communities. It's really about how to communicate with people, which is why I'm so excited to bring you in because the concept that you teach these big, you know, companies can also be be applicable to families, to yeah. friendships. Well, let's talk about purpose for a second. Yeah, you know, too often people in the, who work inside of companies, too often individuals are burdened by the belief that purpose is something that has to exist around them, like. Well, I don't have any purpose in this company. I don't believe in the company purpose, but purpose is something we create. And I feel that like when I was at Deloitte, I was in the lowest level of the organization in a big accounting firm. And I had a vision that this platform, so think of your company, think of where you work as a platform. And this platform can be leveraged for me to find and create and engage my purpose. And so what I did was I knew I loved the kind of work I'm doing now. I loved research. I loved thinking. I thought I would want to be an academic, but I didn't want to be poor. <laughs> so <laughs> I actually, when I was a kid, I went out and got a, a group of interns at Deloitte 
to work with me, and we created a mini research institute. Now, today, there is a thing called Deloitte Research Institute, one of the most prominent research institutes. I created this research institute, and I found my purpose in the work that I was doing, and I led whether I, I was a kid. I didn't have any authority. I led without that authority, and I invented the life I wanted to live, and I invited partners and senior managers to work with me, not the ones that I was assigned to work with, but that I was designed to work with, right? Mm. And with these individuals, we ended up creating extraordinary things. Bottom line is I ended up becoming the chief marketing officer by the time I was 30. And yeah. now there is a Deloitte research that is one of the most prestigious research institutes. Every one of us can create purpose from the people around us, from the mm. missions we have, the platform Think of the platform as the soil, right? Some are more, more fertile than others, but at the end of the day, it's up to each of us to cultivate it, to grow it. I don't want to say to fertilize it because that may be <laughs> taking the wrong, using the analogy too much. But anyway, so purpose is something that is in each of our responsibilities. And that's what we found in the last chapter of the book is all about that purpose. That's beautiful. And there's actually scientific proof that those people that actually – have a sense of purpose in life actually activates the biology of longevity in our cells too. And you brought up a few key points that I want people to, to, you know, to listen to again, it's one finding those things that, that really light you up, that you enjoy that, you know, that, that lighted you up and then actually serving others with that and serving freely with that. I want to get to your new book. Now you started off the book talking about burning man and there's a quote from the founder that says it actually works not in spite of this, harsh desert condition, but it's actually because of these conditions that, that works, that these communities actually get together from this shared struggle. So I ask you, Keith, what do you think the pandemic has exposed in terms of the way we work and why can't we go back to working that way? This episode of the Thrive State podcast is brought to you by the Thrive State Accelerator. The Thrive State Accelerator is actually a home course that I developed using the exact same techniques I work with my celebrity clients, CEOs, and executives on how to get them to the Thrive State. The Thrive State Accelerator teaches you how to master your seven bioenergetic elements. That's sleep, nutrition, movement, stress and emotional mastery, relationships, our thoughts and mindset, as well as purpose. In this Thrive State Accelerator, you're also going to get a bonus module on optimization. That's how I talk about supplementation, peptides, all the optimization techniques I use with my clients to get them to the Thrive State. Now, for some of you who are just joining us for the first time, you guys might be wondering, what is the Thrive State? Well, the Thrive State is actually the energy the epigenetic environment we give to ourselves, telling ourselves, telling our DNA how to act and how to respond. And if we want optimal health, longevity, and peak performance, if we can master these seven bioenergetic elements, our ability to have those three things that we just said, optimal health, longevity, and peak performance is at its greatest. And it also prevents you from getting chronic symptoms like brain fog, being overweight, feeling sluggish, acne, pain, all these chronic symptoms, as well as preventing you from getting chronic disease. So getting to that thrive state is really getting to that state to master being that very best version of yourself. So you could show up for you, for your family, for your business, everything that's important to you. So go ahead, check it out right now at kianvu.com slash accelerator and use coupon code podcast 25 for 25% off. Now back to the podcast. I think we've all heard these analogies, like the greatness in all of us is forged from the hottest fires. The greatest steel is forged from the hottest fires. And crisis does bring out a lot in people. And what I found in our research is more often than not, it brought out the need for community. So when I go to Burning Man, Burning Man is, is something that's interesting. Burning Man didn't start as a as an experiment of generosity. It wasn't an experiment of community, of gifting. It actually started with just a thing that was in a desert. But all of those things evolved out of it. So when you're in the desert and you've got you know, scarcity of water, scarcity in terms of temperatures, blazing hot, freezing cold, what happens is people bond to take care of each other. 
that's what happens. And that's mm-hmm. back to our core essence of survival. That's what happened in our tribal instincts, mm-hmm. right? The tribe steps up and comes to each other in that way. That's what happened this year. And I feel badly for the people who dug into a hole and didn't see what was around them the whole time, which is a support network, an empathy network, a vulnerable group of individuals in need of their support, right? Mm -hmm. But also at the same time, available to us. And out of crisis has forged amazing things. And if you haven't done that yet, the reason we wrote the book, the reason we researched 2,000 leaders, entrepreneurs, individuals, 2,000 people went into the creation of this book. It's competing in the new world of work. And, Mm -hmm. And I hope that you take the opportunity to learn from them. Yeah, over $2 million, I heard, went into the research of this book, yes? Yes, in fact, you know, major corporations invested in this. I I picked up the phone at the peak of the pandemic. I picked up the phone and I called the head of Harvard Business School Publishing and I said, we need to do a research project, we need to do a book, and I don't know what it's going to be on, but it's going to be on what are we learning from this massive inflection point? And he said, done. They didn't have a lot of money, they were worried. They gave me a chunk of change and I said, don't worry about the money, I'll go get it. And I got, you know, 150 from this and 100 from that and whatever. And we ultimately got together two, over more than $2 million yeah. involved in the research. Beautiful. I want to dive into that in the first half of the book where you actually bring the concept together that I think is not only applicable for teams at work, but applicable for you being in your communities, applicable to you and your families, because it's what happens when something hits you hard. And it's really the concept of radical adaptability. And there's yeah. four pillars there that, that I'd love to, to go through because I, I feel that if people could understand this, they could take a hit yeah. and move forward. Yeah, totally true. over what that is? Totally, totally true. But I have a quick question for you. Is this being recorded? Yeah, absolutely. Good. And, and will I be able to go back? I'm seeing such beautiful messages from people I've never met before, yes. but that followed me, et cetera, and I've never engaged with. Will, will I be able to go back and see these in the recording? Uh, I'm not quite sure if the, the messages uh, are saved, to be honest. But if you've left a message for Keith, please send it to his DM today okay. saying that right. you, you listen to this conversation. But but yes, yeah. you've inspired so many people from Yeah, all let me know. World. I'd love to, I mean, like I'm looking here and I'm like, oh wow, we would love to, you know, double click on see that person's profile, etc. So, you know, you yeah. know I'm not as uh I don't spend as much time here as as you do. I have a lot of respect for how much you give. <laughs> To your community, truly. Yeah. But let's back get back to the point. So, look, what does it mean to be radically adaptable? And it starts with number one, keeping your antenna constantly tuned to changes, constantly tuned to changes and opportunities and risks. So, at the peak of the pandemic, there were some organizations that even had operations in China mm-hmm. that were caught on their heels, surprised on March 13th. What the hell? You know, why is it that they had the data, but they didn't turn it into action? Whereas there were other organizations that, like uh, Rick Ambrose at uh, an aerospace company called Lockheed, he did not have operations in China. However, he had a process where on a monthly basis, he'd get together with his team and literally as a part of the agenda, five minutes, he'd say to his team, what risks are you seeing and what opportunities might we be missing? And that simple question to a group of people, and I don't care, you know, Ken, you can do this yourself. I mean, you know, you can just, you could ask your five most intimate friends that question. What do you think are the risks that I'm not seeing? What do you yep. think of the opportunities I'm missing, right? Simple yep. question. You get that triangulation. And Lockheed went fully virtual in February. They, had, they didn't have the same problem finding PPE. Everybody else did. They weren't scrambling. Their technology was was fortified and in place. They went, they, and because of that foresight, then the question is, what is your actionability? Mm-hmm. So foresight is number one, and agile is the other. I want everybody to live their life in weekly sprints. What that means is I want you to think about what are you trying to achieve this week? What is what is great look like? Mm-hmm. Right? What and I want don't want you to think about shit you have to do. I want you to think about things you want to outcomes you are going to achieve. And I want you to write them down. And then at the end of the week, I want you to look at that list and say, okay, what did I achieve? Where did I struggle? What did I miss? What's my next week look like? 
Now, all of that should be, of course, aimed at this North Star strategy of where you're trying to go, right? So, you know, if, if you want to be, you know, my buddy just left as Dr. Oz, he's, you know, as you know, he's a buddy of mine. He just left his TV show to go run for Senate. And there's a vacancy there on air that I want love. that. What is your one week goal? What is your, what are your goals this week to achieve that kind of status? What does an outcome look like? And then at the end of the week, what did I achieve in order to get that? And what did I struggle? And where am I going next week? So, but if you live your life aimed at goals and weekly sprints, mm. then you'll never miss it totally because you're always going to be able to go, okay, this is what I did this week, but it, it, here's what worked, here's what didn't. Now let me recalibrate. That, those recalibrations make sure that you stay on track. So that's very good. Foresight so number agility. one, foresight, have your antennas up, look for the risk and the opportunities. Two, have the agility and move towards your goal. The third thing is inclusion, I believe. Collaboration, yes. and, and it's really all about having a tribe. It's, it's what I've been living my life in constantly, which is how do you make sure that you have the biggest tribe and the deepest tribe? And how do you make sure that they are what I call co-elevating? They're all mm. committed to each other's success. Mm. And I have you on speed dial in so many ways in my life. I mean, you are, you are my longevity coach. You know, you're my dear friend. And I'm, you know, it's interesting. There's nothing, what, what is more important in someone's life than their life, right? And, you know, you are at the epicenter of that part of my life. And of course, you're crucial to me. And I hope that I do that for you, right? I oh, hope absolutely. that in what I can humbly bring to the table, I can't, I can't keep you, you know, living to 150 and thriving. That's your expertise. But I hope I bring things to you. That kind of a co-elevating community, yeah. I want everybody who's watching to have one, right? I want mm -hmm. everybody who's watching to have what, what you and I have. I mean, uh, a mm -hmm. deep commitment and love and care where you're being generous to each other, even when the other person isn't around, like you're, there's some part of you thinking about that other person, that degree of collaboration. And then the question is, how do you make it bold? So the way I wrote this book, the way I wrote this book this year was I ended up getting 2000 leaders and folks involved in this 2000 involved in this book that became my tribe this past year. Mm. Very, very empower powerful, uh, very important. So I went broad, but I also, you know, also stay and go deep. So that's on the, um, that's collaboration and, and then that co-elevation. Yeah. And the last one I believe is resilience. Which is really, we could spend the whole time talking about that because that's your specialty. Yeah. And that's really all about mental well-being, physical well-being, and understanding that, I, as I said earlier, it's no longer an individual sport. You've got to lean on your team for that um, yeah. and co-create your plan, co-create your accountability. I was just on a session this morning with the CEO of Weight Watchers. When my mom lost weight in Weight Watchers, she did it not because of the diet. She knew the diet, right? She did it because of the ladies with her who would show up and, and get weighed in together, right? That accountability, that esprit de corps, that peer-to-peer -peer support. That is that framework right there. And I just want to review it for people. Having the foresight, having your attendance up, the agility, take take that action, including people collaborating. And the last part was that resilience. So let me ask you, Keith, what have you found with the companies that you work with in terms of how they've been able to monitor resilience and practices that they put in to maybe help their employees and team members in the field of mental health and resilience? Well, what we did is a pretty rich study on this, and we found that it's broken into a few areas. One, of course, is there need to be great programs available for people, like you know a company that offers Headspace for mental well-being or Weight Watchers, WW now, Weight WW for you know physical well-being. Um, then that's the programs, resources. But then the other thing is leaders need to be have a heightened awareness that it is their responsibility to cultivate an environment where people are taking care of each other. Yeah. And then the third piece is each of us as individuals need to adopt the right routines, yeah. which if you just, you know, my, my advice to all of you out there is if you just stay here and listen to this amazing man, you'll begin to adopt those routines exactly as you need for personal mental and physical wellness.
Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much, Keith. I know you got to leave soon. Yeah, I do, unfortunately. Uh, so Sorry. Can you let people know where to find your new book? Uh, yeah. Because it's coming out next week, February. Yeah, 15th. first of all, you can get it anywhere right now. But if you want to get the video series that we are giving away for free around the book only this month, then you go to radicallyadapt.com. And once you buy the book, you tell us you did at radicallyadapt.com. We'll send you the video series. So Beautiful. you can buy the book anywhere, but please let us know that you bought it so that we can send you the free video series as a result. And I do appreciate you supporting the book. But most importantly, I'm excited about each of you learning from 2000 of the most extraordinary people on how they leveraged this inflection point of the pandemic to not go back to old ways, but to go forward. What a great concept. And I want to just reiterate to people, it is not just for people in companies. You can use this, apply this in your life, into your communities, into your families. So highly recommend you get it, pre-order it, go to the video course. The last question for you, Keith, is what an amazing life you've had thus far. What has been your best medicine? Love. Mm. See you, brother. I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Thrive State Podcast. And if this podcast is bringing a lot of value to you, if you find that your life is just improving with this podcast, that your life is getting to the next level, please consider supporting it. And here's a few ways you can do so. You can do so by liking this video and commenting on this video and also sharing this video with your friends and family. Another thing you can do is go to ratethispodcast.com slash Thrive State. Go ahead and leave us a five-star review there. It will really, really help this show grow. And it, this will give me more time so that I could actually give more content to you just like you got in this episode. And if you haven't already picked up a copy of my book, Thrive State, your blueprint for optimal health, longevity, and peak performance. You can pick it up now. It became a number one new release in longevity. Go to thrivestatebook.com. And if you enjoy the book, please consider leaving us a review as well. And the last thing you can do if you're liking everything here and you want to work uh, more closely with me as well as my team to get you into the Thrive State, Go to kianvu.com slash accelerator and consider joining the home course, the Thrive State Accelerator. It's really the course that I use. It's the concepts that I use personally when I work with CEOs, celebrities, and my high profile clients to get them to the Thrive State. Again, the Thrive State Accelerator at kianvu.com slash accelerator. And because you're a listener of this podcast, I want you to save 25% by using the coupon code podcast25. I hope we continue to give value to you. And remember always, you are your best medicine. <laughs>